ahead and read. So listen, we're in Matthew chapter 12, and I'm going to read a long passage of scripture. You know, it's always interesting to me, but you know, I think the more that you start to see what the word of God is really saying, and you start to focus some of the things that I even said right after that first song. I did not know that they were playing that other song and you know that other song how it describes you know all this is for you for your glory and your fame it's not about me you know and even all of all of the songs and you know that that whenever we're singing praise and glory to the lord and <clears throat> you know a lot of times when we're early on in our walk or even after we've been in the Lord for a while, we're still very focused on ourselves, right? Because it's our personal life, and I mean, it matters, right? Because, you know, we're being affected by life. But the more you get into the Word of God, and the more we are able to release that over to God is whenever we really start to find some fulfillment in our own personal lives, because it starts to make sense, you know? I tried to tell somebody earlier this morning, you might want to try something a little bit different. You might hear something today maybe that'll make, help life to, to make a little bit more sense mm -hmm. you know because I don't know about you but there's been times even after I've been a believer that I just whenever I wasn't like focused right on the Lord it's like that, what is going on here yeah I feel like I just get up and I almost felt like I felt like, almost like I'm a slave to the system it doesn't make sense to me anyway outside of God. It's like I get up. I work all day. I go to church on Sunday. I go to sleep. I wake up. I repeat it all over again. But I'm telling you right now, once you start to see the, what the word of God is saying and you start to view yourself within this larger narrative that God is real and that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross because why he's creating an eternal family and you hear James talking about the fact that this life is just a vapor it's a temporary moment of time and when you start to be able to believe that then guess what it kind of for me anyway it starts to come into focus it starts to make a little bit no a lot more sense why you're here what what I purpose Amen? All right, so let's read this story here. Uh, and um, so just to give you a little bit of background, you know, Jesus is going in. I find that in this chapter, I didn't go back and read the whole thing to you, but I want you to know that at least two different times it mentions the Sabbath. And and it's almost like they, they're trying to trip Jesus up on the Sabbath. This is something very common. These religious leaders are constantly... Trying to, trying to mess Jesus up, get him to do something on the Sabbath they didn't think he should do. And then they wanted to turn around and kind of like, you see what you did? And he's like, you don't even understand. I mean, he, ne I don't, he never exactly said this, but I'm telling you, you don't understand religious leader Pharisee. He is the Sabbath. But anyway, let's, let's read. All right. So, and when he, when he was departed thence or from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. This is God the Father speaking about the future whenever Jesus would come, the prophet Isaiah was saying that. He said, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. I don't want to get off too much, but I want you to understand, when you see that word Gentile there, 
some people make a bigger deal than what it needs to be. But look, Gentile nations are nations that are not <coughs> Israel. That's the main point here. Heathen nations <coughs> are the nations that are not Israel. The idea is, is that Israel knew God. The Gentile nations did not know God. And that's the point, that God wants everybody to know him. God wants everybody to serve him because he is the one true God. And a lot of my message this morning is about the enemy trying to steal stuff. And he's trying to steal the Gentile nations. He's trying to steal those that don't know God. He's trying to steal Israel. Let me let you in on the secret, my friend. He's trying to steal you. The enemy's trying to steal God's property, but that what this Isaiah prophecy was speaking of is that God wants the Gentile nations to know him also. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. That doesn't mean, I'm not saying any preacher ever said that, but that doesn't mean that Jesus has a problem with people preaching loud. What that's saying is, is that he was meek and mild and he didn't have to go through the streets with a megaphone saying, now he did, he preached. And there were times that he got riled up and there was times he brought correction, right? Amen. But he even said it, there's a right time for everything. And when it was time to go to the cross, like a lamb, he did not open his mouth and he was led to the slaughter. But before then, when he knew they wanted to get him, what did he do? He'd sneak away so that because it wasn't the time yet. He wasn't, so there's a time and a season. You know, I wasn't really, this isn't in my message, but I want to say this. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. You know, we've preached this many a times, but you know what, that, that, that's a personal word for you this morning. A bruised reed means that it's been hurt, but it has not been broken. And then there's still hope for it. Maybe sometimes in your life and in my life we feel we've been bruised. The Lord wants you to know his ministry is not to finish you off. His ministry is to heal you. Amen. He wants to heal you. A smoking flax. Sometimes you feel like there's just barely any little smolder left. Guess what? The Lord knows how to start. I'm just thinking the Lord. The Lord knows how to start a campfire. He, he, knows, how to, he knows how to blow by the, of the wind of the Holy Spirit in your situation. And to get those embers glowing. And to get that fire started again. Amen. Amen. He not quenched till he sent forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. It's going to happen. Every tongue, tribe, and nation. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. And so much that the blind and dumb both spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? You see, the people around started to see it. Now, when you see the son of David, and the one thing about this church, I know that the Lord's called us to make disciples. When you see this terminology in here, you need to understand it means something. Because see, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, the prophets had always told them that there was, a, there was one coming. That's what the word Messiah means, Hebrew for the anointed one. The Christ, the word Christ means Greek. For the anointed one. What I'm trying to tell you is that the prophets of old, even from the fall in the garden, it was already being proclaimed, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. It's being proclaimed throughout the ages, throughout the generations. For Israel specifically that knew the God of the Old Testament, they knew Messiah, the Christ, was coming from the seed of David. That's what, so that's what, whenever, so when he performed this miracle, boom, revelation, everybody in the crowd, they're like, this is the son of David. When blind Bartimaeus was sitting on the side of the road and the crowds came, he says, he cries out. You remember that? I mean, you might not have read it recently, but let me tell you what happened. Son of David, have mercy on me. And, 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 and you know what, what are the disciples do? Even Jesus' own disciples that loved him. Look, they all pretty much all died for Jesus, so they really loved him. Okay, what did it do? Shh, take it down a notch, man, making everybody feel uncomfortable. You know what he did? He cried out all the more, "Son of David, have mercy on me!" And he got Jesus's attention. Yeah. <laughs> he stopped right there, and he then he healed him, yeah. and he opened up his blinded eyes. Amen. And his life was never the same. What are you trying to say, preacher? I don't really know other than right now. 
Don't let nobody keep you quiet. <laughs> Praise God. Because Why? Because Jesus is worthy. That's the whole reason that we're here. Not just to be loud. Jesus is worthy. Amen. But when the Pharisees, oh, here they go. But when the Pharisees heard it, you know what their problem is? They want the glory. They want the honor. You know why? I'm going to tell you right now because, listen, you, you need to hold on to this because I've been chewing on it for a little while now. I don't have conversations because the Lord's got it in my heart and in my head. There's a spirit of religion in the world. Yeah. Do you understand yeah. that? Yeah. I'm not trying to say who got the spirit of religion. That ain't my job. Sometimes I feel like I can sense it. I'm talking to somebody. I mean, and, and Lord knows I don't get it right all the time. But the spirit of discernment will reveal the spirit of, of, of religion. The spirit of religion is different than the true spirit of God. Because the enemy will work through a spirit of religion. See, a spirit of religion is not the Holy Spirit. A spirit of religion is a demonic spirit. Can I just go ahead and say that? I hope you, you may not even be able to buy in with me right now, but I'm trying to tell you, you are a physical specimen living in the midst of a supernatural world. And a spirit of religion is a demonic spirit. And you know what it's trying to do? It's trying to come against the true spirit of God and the true plan of God. And we see it manifest in these Pharisees, but I'm here to tell you it's alive and well today my friend. It's alive and well today in all kinds of religion. I'm going to be nice today. I ain't even going to start calling people out. You just plug in the piece of information to whatever blank you want to plug it into. But I will call out what I've been raised into here recently. Full gospel churches. There's a spirit of religion that is alive and well in full gospel churches. There's a spirit of religion that is alive and well in people's pastors. Yeah. That when they hear, and I'm not saying that it has anything to do with this, and the spirit of religion does not want to release people to where they can go to where there's bread so that their spirit man can be empowered and strengthened and so that they can grow. These pastors don't even know that they're under a spirit of religion. To be fair to them, it's not like they're... The Pharisees knew what they were doing. Yeah. These boys were a mess. I'm telling you right now, I believe from the scriptures, they were working for the devil himself. Jesus said it. He said, your father is the devil. He speaks lies. He's been a liar and a murderer from the beginning, and he's your father, and, and you're operating like him. Okay, I, don't, I think that there was a lot more to that. Okay, I don't want to get caught up in this right now, but I do want to make the point. <coughs> the spirit of religion that wants to try. I had somebody come visit at the church one time. Dude, I ain't never trying to get people to come to my church. Because guess what? Some people aren't even going to like this church. I get it. But we're here to preach the truth. By the grace of God. Amen. Okay, some guy kept telling me, man, I want to come visit. I want to come visit. I'm like, dude, the doors are open. 6.30. Be here, be, you know, be there, be square. He shows up, and you know the first thing, I feel so guilty. Why do you feel guilty, bro? I, I, because he went to another church. I'm like, first of all, you're visiting a service. Ain't nobody trying to get you to come to this church. If you feel obligated to your church, go back to your church on Sunday. But that's weird, dude. I didn't tell him that. I'm telling you. That's weird. That you feel guilty because you went to go visit because you felt like you was going to get something for your spirit, man. And you feel like you're cheating on a church. Now, I can understand you feel like you're cheating on Jesus. Right. Then you feel like you're something's not right. That's a spirit of religion. I'm trying to break it down for you so you can recognize it when you see it. It's a spirit of religion. And guess what? It doesn't want to let you go. It wants to keep you in a spot where the truth is not going forward so that you will stay trapped, so that you cannot be free. Why does he want you free, my friend? So you can be a witness for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so that you can tell somebody, well, I'm never going to do it like you, preacher. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God you're not going to do it like me because the world can only handle so many, right? <laughs> but the Lord will give you gifts. Right. Amen. And some people he's give, gifted you with music, but guess what? It goes past that. Some of it he's gifted you to teach. Yeah. Some of it he's gifted, but it goes past that. Yeah. He wants to just give him time. He's going to keep working on you. He's going to also make you a witness for him yeah. in your own way, according to your own person. Amen. Amen. 
I'm just here to tell you he's worthy. Amen? All right. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub. Can you not hear that spirit of religion speaking from somebody? That, that person's not of the Lord. This person's not of the Lord. Now listen, sometimes they're not of the Lord. Because people probably say, well, preacher, you do that all the time. All right? But what I'm trying to say is, you, you see that? Cast out devils, but by Beelzebub. You know, I did research on this in the past. And Beelzebub, he had multiple names. He was the Lord of the flies. He was the Lord of the dung. He was the Lord of the dead. He's the spirit, the main spirit. Basically, he was another name for Satan. All right? Cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. <laughs> And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, there's a lot that we can break down, but we're going to take, we're going to be careful. Choose our, our passage, okay? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? I covered all this. Y'all remember on that little nighttime Thursday night from my house? I covered this, all of this. It was a, it was a pretty good, I, I mean, not because it was me, but it was a good teaching. It was interesting. So you might be able to find it somewhere in cyberspace, but we specifically talked about all this, and it was very enlightening. Okay. By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But this is the part I want you to see. But if I cast out devils... By the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters abroad. Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We want to give you glory and honor, Lord. We want to thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, and to worship you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in this place. We pray that you prepare our hearts, O oh Lord God, for the truth of your word. And I pray that you would use me as a vessel to speak forth the truth of your gospel, Lord. And that, like your word says, it would not return unto you void, Lord, but you would accomplish through your word today what you desire to accomplish in the hearts and lives of your people. Lord, they're your sheep. They're your people called by your name. I pray that you would feed them and speak to them, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So based upon that main passage of Scripture, this is the title of my message, Your Free Work While It Is Day. And so we're going to talk about some Scriptures to get us going a little bit. What does work mean? What is in Jesus' mind about work? And what does that translate over into you? So let's just look at a few verses of scripture. Jesus and his servants have work. Amen. We have work to do. Look at Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now this is again a big concept that I've been thinking a lot about. In the song, you know, the Gentiles, you know, or, or wherever it came from. I've talked about it this morning. The Gentiles. The heathen, the other nations, all nations. See, when Jesus ascended to the Father, that's what this is. He says, go therefore and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity, my friend. That's not, that's not what we're talking about, though. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus is saying, I need you to take this message of the kingdom and I need you to bring it throughout the entirety of the world. And one thing that I promise you is that if you'll do what I'm asking you to do, I will be with you always, even until the end. I want you to know that, that the Lord will be with us even until the end. But I want you to also see this. Look, this is another scripture that describes the whole world. I want you to try to envision that the whole world the whole purpose of the whole world, look, I'll say it. God, look, Buddha is not the God of anybody. He's not supposed to be. Okay, uh, Krishna is not supposed to be the God of anybody. That's right. People don't like this kind of talk. Oh, you're, you, you, you're, you're causing division. No, I'm speaking the truth. 
Allah is not supposed to be the God of anybody. As a matter of fact, I'm about to ramp it up a little bit. Allah is a demon. He's an ancient moon god. Buddha and the spirit behind him is a demon. They steal in the glory from Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that this earth belongs to God. The, and the fullness thereof, it all belongs to God. He is the creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is. Okay. The enemy is trying to steal glory from God. This place belongs to the Lord. Yes. And, and he sent us Jesus to break us free from that bondage. God wants people to be free. Just as the Egyptians had the children of Israel bound up in Egypt. God told Moses, you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Why? So that they might worship me. See, they were slaves in a foreign land. God said, no, no, no. I've heard the cry of my people. Let my people go. Why? So they might worship me. But Paul in Ephesians says, you has he quickened. What does that mean? He gave you life. Amen. He quickened you who were dead in trespasses and sin. Did you know that before Jesus, you were dead in your trespass and sin? Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. I, I don't know how you used to walk, but however you walked before Jesus, you were walking the course of the world. Some people's course was worse than other people's course. But before Jesus, you was walking the course of the world. Meaning you were being led, like the scripture says right here, according to the prince of the power of the air. See, there, that's talking about the devil. That's talking about Beelzebub. That's talking about the demonic powers. See, this is a very supernatural message because the Bible is very supernatural. There's spiritual entities that are out there that are trying to cause people to walk in a direction that is opposite the direction of God. And he goes on to say this, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. I just got a question for you, church, this morning, whoever would listen. Are you a child of disobedience? Now, I mean, do we disobey? Yeah, we all do. Let's, let's name nobody holier. We're not trying to be holier than now. But are we supposed to disobey? Are we supposed to be children of disobedience and walk in perpetual dis? No, 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 no. We're supposed to be children of the most high. We're supposed to be submitting ourselves to his will. And, and in case, by faith, he will release grace into our lives to strengthen us to be obedient. So we're not supposed to be children of disobedience. We're supposed to be children of the Most High God. And we're supposed to follow after him. But look, the whole world is in a mess. They're under the prince of the power of the air. They're under this spirit. But look, look at this, See, because we're talking about the nations, and we're talking about the fact that Jesus, that, that the nations belong to him, and that this whole earth belongs to him. I just want you to know this is the fast forward passage of scripture. We've already discussed it before, but in the end, it worked. You remember whenever Jesus, the first one we read, go therefore to all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them all things. Commanding them to do whatever things that I have showed you. In the end, it worked. It's working. There's people all over the globe that have been getting saved since the church age started. Do you know that? Do you know that? And we, we do. We know that. that. There's Christians in China. And they're probably not really allowed to worship the Lord. But you know what they're doing? They're, they're being obedient to the Lord. However they're doing it. I'm not saying they're doing it out in the street all the time. Because even as Jesus slipped away, there's a time and a place for everything. There's a whole underground church that goes on over there. It goes on in Russia. It goes on all over the world. There's people. Yeah. Amen. So what I'm trying to tell you is, look, if you read the scripture, it says they sung a new song. Who's they? They're in heaven. They are worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof for you were slain. And you have redeemed us. Hallelujah. A purchase back. How did, you, how did you redeem us? You redeemed us to God by your blood. Oh, that's so beautiful. When you understand what's really going on here. With your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us unto our God kings and priests. And we <coughs> shall reign on the earth. What I need you to understand is. I know that it seems harsh whenever I say things like. Allah is this and the spirit of Buddha is this. But what I'm trying to tell you is the word of God says this place belongs to him. This place belongs to him and he sent Jesus to buy them back because they like slaves in Egypt. 
If they're not worshiping and serving the Lord, then they're not functioning the way that God created humanity to function. And the good news is, is that one day they're coming from every tongue and tribe and nation. Amen. Because Jesus purchased them with his precious blood. That's why the Lord wants us to get our hearts right. That's why the Lord wants us to teach men of all nations. That's why the Lord wants us to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son. Because there's work to do. Amen. Jesus is working. Amen. And his people, his servants. You know, I've been saying that a lot lately. The Lord's been putting that on my heart for about a year now. The word servant. I'm, I'm starting to even understand that more. It's just been ringing in my ear. There's a difference between a, somebody that loves me and somebody that serves me. And I'm not trying to call nobody out. I'm just speaking the truth. There's a difference between, and I'm not questioning whether people love God. I believe that there's a lot of people that love God. There's a lot of people sitting in other churches this morning. Can I just be real? They're under a spirit of religion. They can't get free. Because that, because they feel guilty if they go visit somewhere else. That's a spirit of control and religion. If I ever act weird to you because you told me that you went to go visit another church, Lord, rebuke me, and you have you have permission to rebuke me, okay? Because that's a spirit of control. You're not my sheep. I don't want to be a hireling, but I did not shed my blood for your soul. I'm like a little under shepherd that works for the chief shepherd. Amen. And I am clear as of right now in this moment because of his grace of what my job is to do. My job is to speak the truth and to make this and to use the gift that he's given me to try to help make disciples. Learners of Christ. People that will live. That's what the word disciple means. A learner of Christ. Okay. They're coming out of every tongue, tribe, and nation. Hallelujah. And he has made us to be kings and priests unto our God. Now, this is specifically the work of Jesus. I want you to see this. Boy, this is harvest talk right here. You see that? Look at this. Except a corn. That's old King James language. Don't get a kernel of corn in your mind. It's actually talking about a seed. King James, old King James language. Old English. Unless a seed of wheat... What does it say? Falls into the ground and dies and abides alone. Jesus is talking harvest talk right here. Hallelujah. Basically he's saying unless a seed goes into the ground, then it's just one little seed. Yeah. But if you'll put seed in the ground, guess what's going to happen? It's going to produce a harvest. So Jesus is talking about himself like a seed right now. This is all talk about the cross. This is all talk about being buried in the tomb. This is all talk about resurrection life. This is all talk about the day of Pentecost and the spirit of the Lord descending upon the church and mankind going out and teaching all nations. Baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, the Son. And because see, right now, before he goes to the cross, he's the only holy one. Did you hear me, church? Yeah. <laughs> He's the only holy one in human form. Yeah. Because he was God that became flesh. And he had no sin. But good news, good news. When he planted himself on the ground and he died. And he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he made a whole bunch of holy ones. Oh, what you talking about, preacher? I'm trying to tell you. That's what the word saint means. Hagias. Holy. Set apart. Not talking about your behavior. If you'll line up with the word of God and understand that the Lord has set you apart through the power of the Holy Ghost. Next thing you know, your behavior will start to look more like the Lord. Because guess what? The power of the Holy Ghost will conform you into the image of his dear son. It's the Holy Spirit doing the work. And not you through the motions of religion trying to make yourself better. That ain't going to work. Amen. Amen. Except the seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. And then he goes on to say this. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow. Yeah. Well, what are you saying, Jesus? I need to hate my life. I need to hurt myself. No, that's not what he's telling me to do. Come on, Jesus is the author of life. Amen. What he's saying is, is that sometimes we love our life on this earth just a little bit too much. Does that make sense? Oh, I can't. And listen, I'm not making fun of you. Believe me, I'm being very careful about my words today for some reason. 
When I say this, I am not trying to make you feel weird. When I say things up here, it's usually because I myself have experienced it. There have been times in my walk with the Lord that I know good and well that God just opened up a door. I can literally remember when I just said that standing in an elevator at the old Bayou Pediatric Clinic and the Lord dealing with my heart. I felt so guilty. Why? Because a door had opened up. And, and there was an opportunity for me to say something about the Lord. And the spirit of fear gripped my heart. Whether you've ever, ever seen Matt A. Barry, if you could imagine, I'm telling you right now, spirit of fear gripped my heart. And I did not say, and as soon as the, do the doors closed, whether it was the Lord convicting me, whether it was the enemy trying to beat me down, whatever it was, this overwhelming feeling like, boy, you just missed your opportunity. Part of it was probably the enemy. Part of it was the Lord, but part of it was probably the enemy trying to pound me with it, okay? What I'm trying to say is this. There's been times in my life that I didn't want to be looked at as weird. That I didn't want to be looked at as less than. That I wanted people to respect me. That I wanted people on the earth to like me. That I wanted, you understand what I'm saying? That's me trying to hold on to my little life. Yeah, there's all kind of levels to this. I mean, yeah, you could, you could oh, I want... You know, whatever. We can love our life too much because we're just so caught up in material possessions. But right now, this is just a little illustration. Of <clears throat> See, sometimes we just love our little life so much that, that I can't talk about Jesus right now. I don't want to say his name. People are going to think I'm weird. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm telling you things that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. The Lord wants to set you free. It may not even seem fun to talk about Jesus, but I'm telling you right now. I know I've said it before. But real quick, I'm going to say it again. I've jumped off a bungee cords many a time. I, I've done all kinds of adrenaline rush kind of stuff. Why? Because I like it. I like the way it makes me feel. But I can tell you right now, there is nothing more fulfilling, more exhilarating than being in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody and telling them about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I know they're probably thinking, oh my gosh, what did, what did we do? Man, how do we turn this button off? But it's okay. Because a lot of times I'll ask them, hey, did I go to, oh no, this is good. They don't, I know they ain't always thinking that, but my point is, there's nothing more fulfilling on earth. And again, I'm just trying to say, when you start tapping into it, you're going to realize what your purpose on earth really is. And it's to be a witness for the king. And it won't always come across the way I do it. But anyway, this is harvest talk right here. The Lord is working is the point I'm trying to make. The Lord is working and his servants work. Amen. And if you love your life, you're going to lose it. Go on and try to hold on to that life, whoever you are. Go on. Try to try to pamper it and hold on to it and save it and ta-ta your, your life and all your stuff. Guess what? You don't lose it. The word of the Lord said it. You can't bring that stuff with you, King Tut. You can't put that up in your mummy uh, grave and bring that stuff with you. You're not going, no, 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 no. If you will lay it down, hallelujah, the Lord's going to bless you. Amen. The Lord will bless you and sometimes he'll bless you with prosperity if you feel like he can trust you with it. Anyway. That's most of the time people think about blessing. All right, here we go. Now is the judgment of the world. See, this is all coming out the same passage. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. One of the things that I wanted to make the point before we get into the passage that we read is the fact that Jesus is working and his servants are working with him. I wanted to get across the point that the whole earth and the world belong to the Lord and that the work that the Lord is doing is a harvest work for human souls. But I also wanted to get the point across that there's an enemy. You understand what I'm saying? There's an antagonist to the story. There's, there's this Beelzebub. There's this spirit of religion. There's this spirit of antichrist. There's this spirit of the power of the air that, that moves in the children of disobedience. There, again, you get the point. There's an antagonist. And look, I want you to see this. I just used this scripture. Now is the judgment of this world. See, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He was just talking about planting himself like a seed into the ground. And he's talking about he, the judgment of the world is about to come. And partially, it's coming through me dying on the cross. 
Now is the judgment of this world because, why? Because sin is about to be judged. It's so beautiful. I mean, when you really start to thank you, Jesus, for helping me to understand your word. Because when you start to understand the word, you realize Jesus judged Matt's sin. Jesus, Jesus judged your sin on the cross. And that's what he's saying. Now is the judgment of this world. I'm about to judge the sin of the world on myself. The Father's about to judge sin. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Listen to me, church. What he's trying to say right here is that what I'm about to do, what I'm about to accomplish when I offer myself up on the cross, and I bear the weight of the whole world's sin. And I pay the penalty for the wages of sin is death. Whenever I die for the whole world's sin, judgment of sin is about to go on me. And guess what? They ain't keeping me. In, he didn't say it like this. But they ain't keeping him in the ground. They're not keeping him in the ground. Death can't hold him. Because see, the wages of sin is death. Jesus had no sin. The tomb is empty, my friend. Hallelujah. I know I've said it before, but they found Buddha's bones and they transported them from one spot to another. Buddha's bones are still there. and You can probably go look at them if you get you a flight to Vietnam or Thailand, wherever they are. You will not find Jesus' bones. Amen. Or they were trying to say that they already stole them in him. No, 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 no. Ain't nobody in Jesus' bones. He came busting out the grave. He is the resurrected one and he ascended to the Father. But now the judgment of this world <clears throat> is now. And so shall the prince of this world be cast out. I want you to know that there's coming a day when this will be fulfilled in the physical. Yeah. I got to slow down a second because I think this is important for you to hear. There's coming a day when this is going to be fulfilled in the physical. What are you trying to say? The enemy of our soul is going to be cast into a bottomless pit. Ultimately, the enemy of our soul is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you, right now, right here, the children of God have access to a power source that is greater than the prince of this world. Yeah. Right now, right. you and I have access to grace Hallelujah. to walk in victory. Yes, sir. And right now, the Lord <laughs> wants you to walk in victory. Yes. Because right now, the right Lord now. wants you to quit liking your life. A little bit less and it started letting losing your life on this earth so that you can gain eternal life oh, with him amen. that's the gospel of Jesus Christ I yeah. hope it sounds good to your heart amen. but I want you to see this too in the Greek he said the archon he's the archon of this present time what, what does that mean the chief that means that the enemy of this world some people don't like this. They're like, oh, preacher, you're giving too much glory to the devil. I ain't giving no glory to the devil. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Now, I've made this comment before. Let me try to explain it real quick. Remember in Isaiah, when Isaiah said that there's coming a day when the lion will eat straw like an ox. Where the wolf and the lamb will lie together. Where a child will put their hand on an adder or a snake's hole. That the idea is that the spirit that's prevalent in the air is going to be the spirit of the Christ. What are you trying to say? During the millennial reign of Christ, there's going to be a transition that takes place. I'm not done yet. I got good news for you right here, right now. There's going to be a day when the enemy is going to throw, be thrown into the bottomless pit and his spirit is not going to be the prevalent spirit in the air. And the prevalent spirit in the air that's going to be influencing every life on earth is going to be the spirit of the Christ. But I'm here to tell you that right here, right now, that is not what's going on. But good news, good news, because you, like a little mobile tabernacle, are a piece of geography that the Lord then took back from the enemy of your soul, when you got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you, you don't have to live under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. You don't have to live, hallelujah, under the influence of the spirit of the power of the air that now works in the children of disobedience. You and I don't have to live there. We can live in the kingdom of God right here, right now. Because the spirit of God lives on the inside of us. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but what I'm telling you is the truth. Amen. We can live in the kingdom of God right here, right now. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. But there's coming a day 
when it is going to be manifest on the earth. Oh, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. I always made fun because we used to go to the old church that I got saved in. And that was a good song, especially if you know what it really means. Back in the day, I don't know that they were saying that's what it meant, but that's what I thought they were saying. It's an old Pentecostal song. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Lift Jesus higher. And then they start hitting that tambourine. Lift Jesus higher. See, I was thinking, man, what they're saying is we just need to start singing about Jesus. And then he's going to draw... This he said, signifying what death he should die. Just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Suspended between heaven and earth, the Son of Man must die for the sins of the world. That's what he was talking about. And if you lift me up, if I be lifted up from the earth, if, if, you, if, if, if I die upon this cross, I'm going to provide, I don't even know how to say it. Can I say passageway? I'm going to provide a mode of escape. I'm going to provide a way to set the slaves free from Egypt. I'm going to open up the Red Sea, spiritually speaking, and allow you to walk through on dry ground. I'm about to make a way where there seemed to be no way. Pharaoh might have had the children of Israel blocked in, but hallelujah. Lift your rod over the sea and it was split open. Good news, Christian. Jesus. Has, has opened up the Red Sea, yeah, yeah, yeah. spiritually speaking, yeah. for you and I to walk out. Amen. And that's part of what, he, what we're called to do. We're here to preach the gospel so that people can hear. They may not all want to hear it like that. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. It's time to work, right? You got to work in the light. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not where he goes. And I just want you to see that part there. Yet a little while is the light with you. It, it, it describes a temporary time. There's a time to work. I mean, it seems like it's been a long time, been a couple thousand years. But in the grand scheme of things, it's temporary. There's a time of light. Walk while the light is with you. Lest darkness come upon you. Because guess what? When you're in the dark, you don't know where to go, right? Jesus and his servants have work, right? Now, let's go back to our story. Remember the story? It's been so long, you probably forgot. There was a man with a withered hand. Jesus and his servants have work. And let me tell you something. A man can't work with, or he can't work right with a withered hand. I've seen some people do some stuff that are, that are a little handicapped. And I'm like, goodness gracious. I don't even know why I'm thinking about this. But there used to be a baseball player. His name was Jim Abbott. He was born amniotic syndrome. Just cut off his hand. And this dude would tuck his glove on his right nub, and he'd sit there, and he'd throw a hundred and something mile an hour fastball left-handed, and then after he threw that ball, he'd stick the glove on the other hand, and I'm telling you right now, this dude won the Cy Young Award one year, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, okay, so I'm not trying to say a man would do that, but the point is, is that normally, symbolically speaking, spiritually, you can't work right with a withered hand, because see, there's a lot of language going on here about Sabbath, and work, and he said, which one of you wouldn't pull your sheep out of a pit on the Sabbath? Work, right? So a man can't work with a, with a withered hand. People can't work with blinded eyes, spiritually speaking. Satan withers hands and spiritually blinds eyes. Jesus bound him. That's really my message. I'm finally getting to my message. I want you to know this. Jesus bound him, the evil one. Why? So that you and I can work. Amen. Jesus and the servants have work. So the reading showed us that Jesus was being set up to do work on the Sabbath. You remember that? They were setting him up. They said, is it right to heal on the Sabbath? He heals a man's hand on the Sabbath day, the day that the law said not to work and instead to rest. But now you and I know that Jesus, I don't have time to get into all this theologically, just hopefully you can trust me enough. We know now from the scriptures and from the truth that Jesus was actually the rest that the word of God was spiritually speaking 
So don't let somebody tell you, oh, y'all don't even go to church on Saturday. Y'all don't go. To... Come on, man. Jesus is the Sabbath, not a day of the week. Jesus is the fulfillment of spiritual rest. Amen? All right. Amen. Jesus and his servants have work. Look at this. I'm just talking about work now. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto ye, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, you know me, I, I can be kind of antagonistic. I'm going to take a second here, and hopefully I don't come across the wrong way. But you know, I've been saved a long time. I'm 55 now. I got saved when I was 19. And I've been in Pentecostal and full gospel churches for a long time. And you know how everybody's always looked at that scripture? I want to see the dead raised to life again. I want to see, I want to see, you know, I want to go to this service over here where people, in, in their mind, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit was shown whenever people would fall out and be slain by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just make a, let me just make a couple of comments. First of all, that would be wonderful to see a, a person physically raised from the dead. What a miracle. I'm not opposed to seeing that. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not opposed, and I believe that people do get slain in the spirit. I'm not opposed, but I believe that there's a lot of faking behind that too. And how you, why you want to say that, preacher? Because I faked it two or three times. I'm just being real with you, dude. I'm the transparent preacher trying to tell you the truth. All right? Well, does that mean it's all fake? No. I didn't do it on purpose to fake it. That's what every, I felt like everybody else was doing. I thought that that's what I was supposed to do. Anybody else been there? Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right? Somebody said, been there, done that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate y'all. So it'd be a beautiful thing to see somebody raised to, to life. I heard a story one time, Smith and Wigglesworth said that he, he, his wife died, he picked her up and he put her up against the wall. He said, breathe. And I, think, I don't remember if he put his mouth on her and, and she woke up, according to the story, and she said, Smith, what are you doing? I was in glory with the Lord. Let me go. <laughs> and there she went back with the Lord. So the only reason I can see somebody being physically raised from the dead is that that brother and sister didn't know the Lord. But the whole church, I'm talking about the ones I've been around. I'm talking about my personal experience. All these people talking about, oh, we want to see the dead raised again. We want to see people falling out at the altar. We want to see this. And can I tell you something? I knew these people personally. And ain't none of them told Jesus in a month of Sundays. I mean, ain't not one of them probably said the name of Jesus to anybody in public in a month of Sunday. What I'm trying to tell you is what Jesus is really more worried about than one physically dead person. I'm telling you, Jesus is more worried about you telling a spiritually dead person about the truth of the gospel so that they can come back alive again than he is about one you get to see one physically dead person raised from the dead. But yet the whole I want to see people raised from the dead. I want to I want to do greater works than Jesus. Well guess what? Start by going knock on somebody's door and give them a track and tell them about Jesus. Start by when the Lord leads you to tell somebody about the Lord, whenever it's the Lord leading you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I hope it does, because I'm telling you, I believe it to be true. Greater works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go into my Father. That's what people think about. I mean, y'all, Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, because I've been around a long time. They're like, oh, I want to see somebody raised from the dead. And then, and then once somebody says that they did, and I'm not saying that they didn't, if you got the miracle documented, I know God can raise people physically from the dead. But once somebody says in their ministry, so-and-so raised somebody from the dead, boy, look, now they flocking by the thousands, or they got a, they got a, they got a service over here, people falling out at the altar, and they flocking by the thousands. No, oh, man, we're going to drive five miles. We're going to see people falling out at the altar. You know what Jesus said? I'm not trying to say that that's all what that is, but it kind of makes me feel like it is. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. The only sign that you will see is the sign of the prophet Jonas, who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So what was he talking about? I'm going to show you a sign. You want a sign? I'm going to show you a sign. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be buried in the tomb, and I'm going to resurrect again. And guess what? If you'll believe in that, you're going to see a sign, all right? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come live in your heart, and it's going to change you. And the dead will be raised to life again. Hallelujah. 
Jesus and his servants have work. A man can't work with a withered hand. Hands symbolize work. A withered hand can't work right. And the chapter repeats the Sabbath. But Satan is working through false religion. Right? Then he says unto his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. See, there you go again. Harvest talk. This is about spreading the gospel. This is the kind of work Jesus is talking about. We're farmers. Amen for the Lord. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So there's work to be done. The, the fields are white. They're ready for harvest, but there's not a lot of labor. What, is a, what, what, what does he want you to do? I mean, yeah, okay. We're going to need some people to help us from time to time. I mean, some of y'all are already helping. Thank y'all very much to teach the children. We got other little things. You know, church is small. We don't have a lot of things to do. But many times in the church, I hope you, you're working with me on the time wise. I've been in churches that they had 600 people. And I was in leadership. And I'm not fussing. I'm just telling you the truth of what I experienced. We were, it was a program church. And a lot of times, a lot of truth was spoken. And at sometimes, not so much, but a lot of times it was. But the programs were specifically developed. And listen, this all comes from the seeker-sensitive movement. I said I wasn't going to call nobody out, so I won't say his name. But he wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. <clears throat> and all this came from that, the mega church movement. I didn't just sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night and come up with this. I read about it. I studied it. I've already told you. And I'm not, I don't want to waste time on that. But the seeker-sensitive movement was about church growth. And every pastor wants a big church. Come on, somebody. I mean, how do you want a small church with like 25 people in it? And then somebody comes and visits, look, you got 25 people in this church. And do you realize that there's people both that have been to this church, people that love people that have that come to this church, that have made comments like that? You're preaching to 20 people. Are you being serious? How dare You're offensive, sir. Man, if you're watching, you're offensive to say that, to think that way. Jesus in John chapter 6, the multitudes were following him. He said, my flesh is true meat indeed. My blood is true drink indeed. They were offended. This is a hard saying. And they all started to leave. You know what he did? He turned to his disciples. You going to leave me too? See, the more the truth is spoken and the less the focal point becomes self and the more the focal be point becomes the darling of heaven, Jesus Christ, the less people like it. Feed me, preacher. Tell me what I want to hear. That's why the scripture says they will heap to themselves piles of preachers having itchy ears. And the word in the Greek means pleasant words. People want pleasant words. We all want pleasant words. Like what you going to do? You're going to watch the motivational speaker on TV? You know? He's going to encourage you to do it, but he ain't never going to... Can't even tell Larry King on TV that homosexuality is wrong. Can't even tell Larry King on TV that Mormonism is not true Christianity. Did you know Mormonism teaches that Lucifer and Jesus are brothers? You can't say it, well, come, well you know, Larry, I'm not going to say who he is, because I promise y'all wouldn't say his name. Yeah, come on, it's not Rick Warren. Come on, Larry, you know, I can't say that they're not. I'm not trying to say that, that there can't be homosexuals that don't love the Lord and still in bondage, and the Lord wants to set them free, just like you might still deal with pornography or something like that. I get that. But don't sit here and tell me that it's a normal way of life. Don't sit here and tell me that it's an okay way. I know they're going to probably kick us off. Oh, well, it is what it is. Don't tell me that it's normal yeah, yeah. because the word of God says it ain't normal so no it's not and, 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 and you know it's a, it, I want pleasant words I want you to motivate I want you to be my cheerleader you know no that's not the truth Amen. that's not the truth so the harvest is plenteous but the laborers are few Jesus is doing work so people can't work with withered hands and they can't work with blinded eyes so I'm talking spiritual amen See, look, whenever you're spiritually bound up, whenever you're spiritually bound up, you can't do the work of the Lord. Amen? That's why the Lord wants to set you free. Amen. When you're spiritually blind, you can't see where you're going to do the work of the Lord. Right. That's why the Lord wants to set you free. Amen? And that's really what was going on here, I believe. So eyes symbolize spiritual sight. 
The man was blind and bound by Satan. The world is blind and bound by Satan. God's people are supposed to see and be free. Amen? Amen. And, and so look here. Let's, let's just look at it. John 3, 3. Look. Just look at the, a couple of these scriptures. We're almost done. We're going to take communion. Y'all are going to have a blessed day. Amen? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, some people, they look at that scripture and they're like, well, that's not even what he's talking about, preacher. When he's saying can't see, he means you won't see like enter in. Well, later on, he says, if you're not born again, you can't enter in. And what I'm trying to tell you, spiritually speaking, unless a man is born again, he cannot see spiritually the kingdom of God. There's a whole lot of spiritual stuff on this earth that our logical mind cannot comprehend. I hope that you know what I'm talking about. We think a lot, and there's nothing wrong with a logical mind. There's nothing wrong with pragmatism. There's nothing wrong with intellect. God gifts us all with various levels of that. But it's, it becomes a problem if it prevents us from being able to see spiritually. And we're unable to see with spiritual eyes. The letter to the Corinthians, Paul said, the natural mind, that means separate from the Spirit of the Lord, cannot perceive the things of God. Instead, they're spiritually understood. So until you're born again, you don't even got a chance. And then when you're born again, you still may not be able to see. Amen? So we're, people can't work with blinded eyes. And look at this scripture here in Corinthians. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So the God of this world blinds the minds of people, right? To prevent them from being able to see. So spiritually speaking, that's what's going on. The, and and look, look at this scripture, Paul said, the eyes of your understanding, spiritual eyes is what he's talking about, would be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory in the inheritance of the saints. So we're talking about the fact that Jesus wants to heal us so that we can work. Amen. Jesus wants to heal our eyes spiritually so that we can see. Amen. Amen. Jesus put Satan in his place. I'm closing. I promise. I got two more little slides. Jesus put Satan in his place. Amen. Amen. Satan has been lying and stealing from God since the beginning. And Jesus came to take it back. Here's a couple of scriptures to show you what I'm talking about. Look at it. For God knows in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Not as God. Somebody was talking you know, was saying that the other day, like not in, I'm not saying that in a negative way. They said that that's just how they had always perceived it. It's not saying you will be like, at, like, like God, like this is going to bring you closer to God. No, this is going to make you something that you're not already because you know, you're not, there's something better for you to be. Okay. That's an easy way to say it. He says, no. So he, basically the enemy has been stealing everything from God from the beginning. Okay. Jesus put Satan in his place. Look at this one. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know we used this the other day, but this is the prayer that Jesus gave all of his servants of all time. And I want to make this point that the way things are in heaven right now, it don't look nothing like it does on this earth. Again, there's coming a day when all of that is going to change. Amen. The kids are coming in. We're going to take communion here in just a moment. Okay. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth. As it is in heaven. Look at this. Revelation 11, 15. There's coming a day. The seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying. The kingdoms of this world. Are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I want you to notice that right there. I don't know if you ever paid attention to that before, but this is further proof of what Jesus was saying about the prince of the power of the air. This is further proof about 
the fact that, that he called him the prince of this world. This is further proof that the majority of human beings are under the bondage of the enemy and that they don't belong to God, but that there's coming a day whenever literally, physically, Jesus is going to make the final move and he's going to physically be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and his people. Yes. You know, scholars call it already not yet. What you trying to say? He already died on the cross. He already defeated the enemy. He's already defeated the works of Satan. But he is not yet sitting on the throne, on David's throne on the, on the earth. Does that make sense? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But the Bible says one day he's going to sit on David's throne. And he's going to rule upon this earth. Okay, he's going to take these kingdoms back. And I just wanted you, I want you to see that. Because I, why, are you, why are you making such a big deal? Because there's work to do. Because Jesus is working. Because his servants are working. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Command them to do all these things that I showed you. There's work to be done. People at school, the people you go to school with. If they don't know Jesus, guess what? It's your job as the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you to mention the good news about Jesus. I can remember one time, and Lord, I hope I didn't put too much pressure on her. But I can remember I was driving, driving her to school. Sierra, maybe you're watching this morning. I don't know. And I said, baby, you've been friends with that girl a long time. Have you ever mentioned Jesus to her? Because, like, she's your little bestie. And she ain't saved. Have you ever mentioned Jesus? Lord, no. I'm like, well, you might want to think about that. I mean, and, you know, we are taking another notch. I mean, there she is. She dies one day. And she's like in hell being tormented. And she's like, Sierra never told me about the Lord. Sierra never told me that I'm being tormented and all of it. Nobody, and she had the opportunity to tell me. And I mean, you know, unfortunately what that did was it motivated her to do it in her own strength. And she, you know, she tried. She was just trying to be a good little girl for her daddy. And she said, hey, you ever heard of being born again? And the little girl said, no. She said, you might want to look into that. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, young person, is that, that, that that's not the will of the Lord either. The will of the Lord is for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And for you, with the power of the Holy Ghost, to be a witness for the Lord. To do the work of the Lord. Amen? Praise God. Well, here we go. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. But if, and then we're back to our text. But if I cast out devils, this is Jesus talking. If I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You can say that I'm doing this in the work of the, of the devil. You can say I'm doing this in the name of Beelzebub. But I'm here to tell you the reality is this. Y'all been waiting a long time for Messiah. And I'm here to tell you that if I'm casting out devils by the Spirit of God, then guess what? That day you've been waiting on, boom! Right here, right now, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And look what he says in this little passage of scripture right here. I, my whole message, all that wording I used was about this. <laughs> How else can one enter into a strong man's house? What does that even mean? I mean, I would say Rich is the strong man of his house. Robert's the strong man of his house. Wade's the strong man. Don is the strong man of his house. I don't know much about guns, but I'll be honest with you. I ain't scared to tell you. I own two of them. I ain't never, I ain't never even shot one of my guns. I got a little lock on my bedroom door that you got to have a fingerprint to get in to buy me two seconds. I ain't want to take nobody out. But if you bust up in my house, I promise you, you bullets will fly. <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to tell you, don't be coming, freak me out and wake me up and bust through my door. Because it's my house. And that's what the strong man of the house means. But see what he's talking about? He's talking about the devil. <laughs> because he just cast the devil out of a man. And he's already gone through much teaching to describe that the devil is kind of sort of right now the strong man of this house. Talking about this whole world. 
but not over you because you're a believer. We already talked about that this morning. You're a child of God. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. He ain't the strong man of your house. But many times, people are living in a way that's less than where they should be. Right? right. right? What I want you to know is what he said is, how do you enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods? You know, the Lord revealed this to me a long time ago. We're in the midst of a war. And just like in a war, whoever the victor was, he got the spoil of the war. What is the spoil? It's all the golden cups and the chalices and the golden coins and the food and the cattle and all of that kind of stuff like that. That we're in a war and the war that we're in is spiritual and that the spoil of this war is the souls of men. And what this scripture is saying is, is that you can't enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except you first bind the strong man. Now I hope this never happens to anybody, but I mean, I've, you've seen movies before where somebody busts up in the house and they tie the people up in the chair. I mean, you ain't going to get your gun if you tied up in a chair. But what Jesus did, spiritually speaking, was he bound the strong man. That's my last scripture because, you see, when you look at that, and I just found this new little thing on my... That, that's actually, look at this right here. That's the word bind. You see that? I clicked on the Greek word. Look what it means. I want you to see this. Can you see that? No, you probably still can't see it. I magnified. To bind, to tie... To bind or fasten with chains, to throw into chains. What Jesus has done when he died on the cross, I want you to understand this, young people, you're, you're smart enough to understand it too. Holy Spirit revealed it to us all. What Jesus has done on the cross ties up the devil in your life. Oh, you got to believe God for it. You got to be able to trust the Lord. If I would have thought about it, I would have pulled a chair up here and asked Angie to tie, wrap me up in some yarn. Like she did to me that time, right? <laughs> what Jesus did at the cross has bound the enemy in your life. Spiritually speaking, you don't have to live in bondage. Right. Adult, you don't have to live in bondage. It's really kind of as easy, Lord help me, right? But it's really kind of as easy as Nancy Reagan said back in the 80s. Just say no. But she was saying it without Jesus. I'm trying to tell you. With Jesus. Right. By the grace right. of the Lord. Right. As we surrender our will to the Lord's will. Because Jesus died on the cross to set us free. And we say not my will but your will be done. Grace flows from God. From what Jesus has already done at the cross. And empowers us. Amen. To live a life. Amen. That brings him glory. Amen.